And um, th my, this talk and the following talk are connected. Uh, I'll be talking about the location data collection system on Nimbus 3, 4, and 6, and uh, which were really scientific experiments uh, that were designed for tracking meteorological balloons and buoys and so forth, drip, free drifting. Um, but there was a spin-off called Search and Rescue that came out of this, and we began to look at it. So my talk will be linked to Tim Sinkfield, who's sitting here from the NOAA Corps, and he'll follow up with what I say on the operational part of Search and Rescue and how it's evolved and how they're operating the program. So, um, as I said, uh, Nimbus 3 and 4 uh, had a system called the EARLS, uh, the System Interrogation Recording Location, and Nimbus 6 had a scientific experiment. Uh, Paul Julian was the PI, and, and Vern Sumi was the co was was a co-I on that. And I was a co-I also. And I'll be talking about some of our, de our search and rescue demonstrations here. So here's the Earl system on Nimbus, and you have to remember that this was way before GPS. You, you have stuff in your phone. It's more complicated and sophisticated than what we had here. But this was um, very early on, and um, and as you can see, we had um, surface platforms around the world. The, orbit, the satellite was programmed each orbit with commands for each of these platforms, and the satellite would send a command, and it would, uh, the system would respond, and we'd get a, a range distance, and it would send a frame of data with sensor data or as I'll talk later with some search and rescue messages. So this was the EARL system, how it worked. Again, you have to remember that um, this was not real time. This was sun synchronous orbit, so every 12 hours or so we could get a pass over some of these things. But it, but it did serve to uh, demonstrate the uh, concept. Uh, here's some of the early uh, drifting buoy data that we always thought was interesting in the Arctic. We did, two buoys were deployed here and they meandered all over the place and they all ended up right in that little fjord. We, we were very intrigued when that happened. It must have been a downwelling or something that drove them in there. Um, here's a, one of our first rescues, you might say. There was a buoy deployed off Puerto Rico. It was uh, operated by the National Oceanographic Office. It was a very sophisticated, large buoy system. I don't know what it was worth, but it was considered very important for their work. And it, it broke its mooring. And here we, and of course Nimbus was now tracking it. And with this uh, last location here, we were able to steer a ship to it. And they were totally elated with this. It was the first time we rescued something. It happened to be a drifting buoy, but it saved them a ton of money. They, I don't remember what the um, impact would have been otherwise, but it would have been tremendous to, to recover that thing. They would have been searching all over the ocean for it. We did a balloon experiment on Nimbus 3, and this is, believe it or not, that's the gondola that flew on a balloon. Now that little thing there is our antenna, and our box is inside here. We're not, that's not our thing. And this was under the control of NCAR, and it was just to show that we could, we could track a balloon, because that's really what we were setting out to do eventually. And here's the balloon package that we developed for Nimbus 4. Uh, this box is about 12 inches by 6 inches. And they flew quite high, a little solar panel. And we actually launched uh, from Ascension Island, 30 of these uh, that went uh, into the tropics and were tracked. And here we sh I show a copy, a uh, picture of the launch itself. You see the balloon in that package underneath. And uh, this, this uh, cart would travel along the runway at, at Ascension Island at the same velocity as the wind. And when they match, then you can let the balloon rise up vertically. And uh, there's actually another pilot balloon here that you, it's hard to see that gave us the indication that we were at the right velocity. And, uh, and here's some examples. The balloons went up to 30 millibars. And here's some, some tracking data from one of those balloons. And you can see that they really traveled around the equator. And they never seemed to leave. leave. However, we did have a cut down mechanism on the uh, balloon in case they drifted over into China or some other country. We actually had to cut down some that left that little path there. And eventually we got to uh, 
the, the animals. That's a, that's a 25 pound package. And remember, it's the state of the art. <laughs> and we actually named that elk Mo for Mo Schneebaum. Um, and here's, here's uh, Sheila Scott. Sheila is a British pilot. She was a dame. I think that's the equivalent to a knight in, in Britain. And when uh, her organization approached us, it was as if the British government was asking us. So naturally, we agreed to track her. And her, uh, she had a little Piper Aztec. Her, her goal was to, to fly solo around the world. And she was not the first to try that. But and part of her flight was a, a flight over the North Pole. So she was the first female solo pilot to go over the pole in a little plane. Um, so here's the plane. That's our antenna that had to be certified by the FAA. And uh, here's, her, here's Sheila's flight over the pole. At this point, I want to mention that this is just a part of her round the world trip. She went to countries all over the world. And every time she landed, there seemed to be a crisis. A battery was bad or the plane was, engine was overheating. There was always a crisis and actually, you know, the reporters were there and she was in the newspapers and so forth. And we started to worry about this leg of the mission. Uh, because uh, this was going to be kind of hazardous, flying from here all the way over there with no, nothing in here. And um, by the time we got to, uh, I forget, that's Norway, by the time we got there, uh, we didn't have much choice. We had an astronaut with us giving her instructions, by the way. And then uh, she took off, and my gosh, she went right over that pole, as fast as, as clear as we could see. She went right over the top of it. And then flew over to Alaska to Barter Island where the radar picked her up, and then she continued on. And when she finally landed, somebody told me they heard a sigh of relief from NASA headquarters out in Greenbelt. <laughs> Um, and she wrote a book. There's an interesting book she published with the whole story of this. So uh, Sheila didn't need to be rescued, but she did have a code that she would have sent that told us that she needed help if, if she needed it. Uh, moving on to Nimbus 6. Now this is the Twirly experiment. I mentioned Paul Julian and Vern Sumi were the co or the principals on here. And this, um, I keep hitting that darn button. This, um, didn't have the command link down that I showed, talked about on the Earls. Uh, these platforms, balloons and buoys, had timers. They transmitted one pulse per second, one second per 60 seconds, rather. And they were random, totally random, incoherent. And that time shift and the Doppler shift combined would enable us to have as many as 200 in the field of view. And the mutual interference, even though they were transmitting randomly, was so, so low that it was not negligible. And uh, so the equipment that was on the um, platforms was obviously smaller and lighter and lower power, and, and, and Doppler was used here. And uh, again, the main purpose of this was the balloon and, and the buoys. Now here's an example. Here's a picture of our balloon package that we developed for that system. That antenna is a piece of mylar, and that's about two feet tall. And this balloon had to be designed so that it was non-hazardous to an aircraft, an airliner, a passenger airliner. And we actually did extensive testing of this to make sure that it would, and if an airline hit this anywhere along the path, a string, it would ingest the package and grind it up, it'd be no problem. Fortunately, we never heard of any attempt to do that, and I'm glad it wasn't in the airplane that tried it. But we. Uh, here's some balloon data from that experiment. Again, this was Paul Julian and, and Vern Sumi had this experiment down here in the bottom. And Paul was interested in this tracking data. And my role was to uh, deliver the spacecraft processor. And I want to give some credit to Mort Friedman here who gave us the idea for the processor that we used to process that data. So here's a, a buoy, a electronics unit, and that's about 12, 14 inches. And here's an example of a free drifting buoy. Where I don't remember how many we had, but there were a lot of them. And you can see the drogue would be dropped down and that would capture the subsurface current. And that's how 
the buoy would be propelled and we would track the free drifting buoy. And here's an example of what the buoy looked like. Uh, Ron Browning mentioned uh, the double eagle in his talk. This is a uh, this was a, a real rescue. This is our first real rescue. Uh, three fellows were going to attempt to cross the Atlantic in, in a balloon, a hot air balloon, from, um, the, from here, Cape, Cape Code, all the way over to Paris. They should have, the flight should have taken them like that. And they got caught in this circulation here, and, and, and they had to be rescued. So they, they sent the code. We had a code in the package, and they sent it, and we detected it. And that's the... Um, the uh, Coast Guard vessel, and you see that little black circle shows our antenna on that that little gondola. They, that, that's the gondola that was suspended below the balloon, and it floated, fortunately. And so there were three men in there that were rescued because of data. So that was kind of setting the stage for the technology that was evolving there. Um, this is the same experiment. I, I talked about the fact that we had to rescue them there, but they didn't give up. They came back and they tried it again, and here they finally got the, the, the ark right, and they landed in Paris. And in the back, there's a poster with their pictures in it. We had a press conference at, after they came. They came back out to Goddard. Uh, here's another interesting experiment we did, uh, headed towards search and rescue. This fellow's name was Naomi Uyomura, a Japanese explorer, and he was going to. Well, he did. He, he, took a dog sled, I keep doing that. He took a dog sled over Greenland, all the way across the, from north to south, as a solo. And um, he was collecting scientific data along the way, and there's our antenna. And uh, it was, I don't remember the exact duration, but he had to be re resupplied with um, food and other things. And um, the way that worked is uh, he had a pilot, a Canadian pilot would, uh, take our position that we had and start flying towards hit that position. And uh, eventually he'd, be coming, he'd come into radio contact with Naomi. And what would happen is Naomi would watch the dogs. The dogs would hear the aircraft before he did. So he would tell the pilot where the dogs were looking. And then the pilot would use that heading in our location to, to zoom in on them, and he came right in. So, so he had the satellite and the human and the dogs all working together. <laughs> and it worked very well. <laughs> but he didn't have to be rescued. We never used the code. Um, this is the list of uh, experiments that we had on that. There were 49 of them. These are some prominent scientists in here. And at the end of the Nimbus 7 twirly experiment, this list was sent over to NOAA. NOAA was getting ready to launch the Argos system, which is an operational version of what we just talked about. And um, so that led them into the, uh, the operation field. So m most of those users that we in indoctrinated and showed how, how to treat the data uh, joined Argos, and, and of course this is still running today as far as I know. Um, and in 04, when I last showed this data, they had 400 programs and a lot, lot of platforms on the earth. They were charging for it, it was operational, but it was a, a, um, it was a non-profit, it wasn't a profitable organization here. <coughs> and. Um, Eventually, they, um, they, they, they began experiment with the use of GPS when it finally came along. So it was a very successful program that laid the, that laid the basis for the follow-on. So here's the evolution of some of that technology. You remember that 25-pound package? Well, now they got, they got smaller. And here's a polar bear. That, th these are from Argos now. That, and um, they even got the birds, and they still do birds. <laughs> Uh, here's the evolution. Here's the here's the concept of this SARSAT. I have to give uh, Bill Reddish some credit here for this because this this was not an easy program to sell. You might think search and rescue is so noble and so so beneficial that you could easily sell it, but we had a heck of a time. We were, you wouldn't believe the things we were told about. 
and I'll mention it later. But uh, this is the Kospass Sarsat. Kospass is of Russian, and this program eventually had um, the U.S., France, Canada, and Russia, four countries. And Bill gets credit for working that whole community, including NASA headquarters, by the way, uh, in, order to pull, in order to pull this together. Um, it was not easy to sell, as I mentioned, Bill and Bernie Trudell and myself. I worked, Bernie and I worked for Bill at that time. And um, we, had, we went to headquarters after a year or so of developing this plan and presented it, and we were told to go home. That uh, NASA was not going to be buying a system to save people that can afford to buy their own airplane. That's what we were told. <laughs> now, we were devastated. We were, oh. And then all of a sudden, Senator Hale Boggs from Mississippi, a real close, powerful guy, was lost in Alaska and didn't have any transmitter. And all of a sudden, we got called back to headquarters. <laughs> And from that on, we had a program in uh, 1985. And again, I mentioned these countries. Today, well, when I showed this chart 10 years ago at the 40th, we had, there were 38 countries in the program. There's probably more than that now. This is the number they gave me at that time. And I think what's happening now is, you'll hear me from Tim, that GPS and ge geostationary satellites are now taken over we had the polar orbit with the time delay in between the passes, 12 hour. And this, of course, gives you real time. So uh, in order to help promote that system, we made these bumper stickers and, and <laughs> encouraged, encouraged people to help support our program. <laughs>